perfect. And then lecture 11, perfect. All right, so I want to actually finish um, this lecture that we were looking at last class. So we were talking about Valerian, right? Um, and Castile. And this is two phrases from the language Valerian. Um, Valar Morgulis and Valar Doheris, all men must die. And I kind of talked to you about the number marking. Uh, if you remember, uh, towards the end of last class, I said that the way languages do number marking can be different depending on what language family you belong to. So in English, number is marked twice. Um, it's also marked in the numeral and it's also marked on the noun. So you have three books, but there are other languages. And I said, my mother tongue, Malayalam, um, only does number marking on the numeral and not on the noun um, per se. So we have in Malayalam and in other languages that do this, we have three book without the plural marking on the noun. And we were kind of talking about the two phrases that I uh, put up uh, earlier, Valar Morgulis and Valar Doheris. And I said, Valerian actually has a, a, a different kind of number system compared to um, English. English has a singular marking and a plural marking. Um, Old English also had dual marking, but you know English has since lost that dual marking. But what Valerian actually does is Valerian has a collective number, which means all, right? A collective unit called all. Uh, and David Peterson, who created Valerian, also added a kind of a rare number marking system called POCO. Um, and this is in English, the, the closest example that I can give you in English is a few where there is no specific upper bound to that uh, particular number marking. So this was what we looked at towards the end of last class. Um, we, we have a four um, number system in Valerian. Valerian has singular number plural number, collective number, and pocal number. And depending on what number system you get, you actually have a difference in verbal agreement. So if you are a singular number, you have one actor and singular verb agreement. If it's plural, then you get plural verb agreement. Collective, again, has singular verb agreement, but the difference is that it is treated as a collective unit, such as all. And pocal again, has plural verbal uh, agreement, and it is very similar to uh, a small number of actors, but they're not treated as a cohesive um, unit. And I, I gave you this visual imagery um, to kind of drive home the point uh, between singular, plural, collective, and pocal. Uh, so singular is when you have one actor, Plural is when you have um, many uh, different kinds of actors, but they don't all you know, act as one unit. Uh, collective is when you have many actors, but they kind of act together as one unit, like a committee uh, in English, when, when the committee decides one thing, even though individually there could be disagreements right, uh, in the discussion. And then you have pocal, where you have a small number um, of actors, but they are not a cohesive um, unit. So now that we've discussed the number marking, I want to kind of end this lecture by talking about the verbs of Valerian. Again, going back to the two phrases, valar morbulis and valar doheris. So we talked about valar, which is the word for all, which is a number marking. And then the verb in that particular phrase is the morgulis or the doheris. And as you can see, the common factor between these two verbs is the is ending at the end of the verb, is. So you have morgul, doher, and then you have the is marking. So now the question is, going back to the, um, the meaning that I had for these two phrases, all men must die and all men must serve, the question that comes with the, the verb or the ending on the verb is that, is that the morpheme for must, right? I mean, if valar is all, Morgul and doher is a root of the verb, right? Serve and die. Then, you know, logically, you must be thinking is should be the must, right? Or the tense and aspect information on the verb. So let me try to give you a, a 
very brief crash course in tense and aspect. I mean, this is probably familiar to a lot of you, uh, but it's, I think, good to refresh your memory on what is tense and what is aspect in English, because there are some differences between tense and aspect. So here I've given you tense marking in English. So whenever you think about tense and marking, tense and aspect marking, you're always talking about the verb, right? So that's the first thing that you have to remember. Nouns cannot have tense and aspect markings on them. Nouns can have a singular and plural marking. So nouns can have number markings, but cannot have tense and aspect markings. Whenever you see tense and aspect, it's a morphological marking on the verb um, of languages. So here is a very simple uh, table for tense in English. So in English, you can say, I walk, I walked, I will walk, right? So you have present tense marking, which is null, right? There's no morpheme for the present tense uh, marker in English. Uh, the past tense marker in English, which is walked with the ed, um, and the future tense marking, which is an auxiliary verb of English, the will um, morpheme right, or the will uh, word, right? So now this is uh, what we call a three-part tense marking system. Languages across the world does not do it the same way as English. There are languages in the world that only have um, a, a past tense and a future tense and no present tense marking or no present tense at all, right? So very often you call those languages plus or minus past languages. So either it's past tense or it's not a past tense. Doesn't mean it's in the present, but you know it could be in the future. It could be in the present. We don't know. It's ambiguous between the two uh, kind of meanings. Uh, but English, I think, is one of those languages that actually has those three distinct uh, tense markings. Pretty, you know, robust. Now, what about aspect? So aspect has to do with the continuity of the verb right? The continuity of the action described by the verb. That's what we mean by aspect. So tense is very often um, time. The time that we talk about when we talk about a verb, is that action happening right now? Did it happen in the past? Or is it going to happen in the future? Where it says aspect is the continuity of that action. Mary reads a book. is called the habitual aspect. It means that Habitually, Mary reads a book, right? It, Mary loves reading. Um, and so very often you will find Mary reading a book. It is a habit of Mary. It's a habitual aspect um, of, of, of Mary to read a book. Another example of a habitual aspect in English is the sun rises in the east. It is the habit of the sun to rise in the east. There is no day when you wake up and the sun is actually in the west and not in the east, right? So we call that habitual aspect again, sun rises in the east. Same verbal agreement as Mary reads a book, right? With that S marking on um, reads right there. The perfect aspect of English is I have studied for the test. You have finished studying for the test, you are ready to take your midterm, you're, you are no longer studying for the test. You feel prepared, right? There's no more preparation that you are going to be doing between the time that you say, drive to school to take your midterm or something like that, all right? I have studied for the test. So you have an auxiliary verb, the have, with the main verb, study, in the past tense. I have studied right? Perfect aspect. I am listening to the lecture right now. You're listening to me uh, talking. That's progressive aspect. This lecture is happening as we speak. It is continuous, right? Sometimes you also hear the term present tense continuous, right? It's very similar to progressive aspect. So I am listening to the lecture. So listening, as you can see, is, is in the ING format which is what we call as the gerundival format of the verb, right? It's a gerund. So I am listening to the lecture progressive um, aspect. And we have been studying as perfect progressive. So that's an aspect that is actually a combination of the perfect aspect and the progressive aspect. We have been studying um, for the test, 
right? It doesn't mean that you have finished studying for the test, and it doesn't actually mean that you are actually studying for the test right now as we speak, but it's, it's, it's a process that has happened across a period of time and it might actually continue in the future, which is why it's called as perfect uh, progressive. So again, very often in English, to distinguish between these different kind of aspects, you see the morphological markings, right? So habitual aspect marked with the S marker, perfect aspect with the auxiliary and the past tense marker, uh, the progressive with the gerundival ing and the auxiliary am, and perfect progressive with the have been, the en kind of construction, right? Very different morphological uh, markings in English. So let's go back to Valerian to kind of answer the question whether the is ending in Doheris and Morgulis is actually aspect or tens or number or what is it, right? Now, what David Peterson actually did for the uh, tens and aspect markings on Valerian was to actually model them on Latin um, verbal formation. All right. Um, so what he did was just very similar to Latin verbal ending. The Valerian verbal endings also showed agreement in person and number. So whether you're first person or third person or second person, singular and plural, you would actually show that information on the verb. But he also incorporated passive forms of the verb. So passive is, uh, as in the example, John has eaten in the past, right? He's already finished eating versus John ate. John ate is in the active uh, voice and John has eaten is in the passive voice. So he kind of modeled the passive um, voice for Valerian. And he also had subjunctive mood ending. Uh, mood is something which is different from person and number. Uh, it's very, very common in Latin. Uh, actually, you know, the whole the idea of mood comes from, you know, how Latin actually modeled the ending on verbs. Uh, but obviously, English has it, German has it, French has it as a byproduct of um, being derived from Latin. Um, so let's actually then again try to figure out what is the is ending in Morgulis and Doheris. Now, we kind of speculated that maybe it is similar to the must, the word must in English. Now the word must in English actually has three different meanings. It, it's highly ambiguous in its meaning and its semantic content. So I want you to look at these three sentences that I have um, for you with must in them. The first one, as you can you know, possibly guess is from the Wizard of Oz. To get to the Emerald City, one must follow the yellow brick road, all right? The second sentence is, if the ball is put in play, the batter must run to first base from baseball. Uh, you know, you could probably find it in a rule book of baseball. And in the last, humans must breathe air. Do you find any difference in the meaning or the semantic content of these three sentences that actually have, as a common factor, the word must? Could you say that again? So there are three sentences here on the slide with the word must. As native speakers of English, I'm asking you, do you find any difference in the semantic content of these three sentences with the words must in it? Or do you think the word must has the same meaning across all three different um, sentences? You might have to read it a couple of times in your head. I think the first two seem pretty similar because it's, I mean, there's still the option that they might not follow it or they might not run to first base. Uh -huh. So that one's a little bit more up to the person, but then humans must breathe air. That's not something you can choose to do or choose not to do. Yeah. So let me let me uh, you know um, give you a terminology, Olivia, for what you just said. So I'm going to introduce the notion of volition, right? So there's a notion of volition that is crucial, I think, for 
the third sentence, humans must breathe air, is something which is not voluntary, right? It's not in your volition. I mean, if you are a human being and you want to be alive, you need to breathe air, right? You're, you're breathing air as we speak right now. It's, it's something that's completely involuntary, right? Versus that aspect of volition that Olivia just brought up, right? In the first two sentences, you're expected to do it, but you might not do it, right? You might Right? Is that Kelly? Is that what you wanted to say? I know you unmuted yourself. So, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I I noticed that in the third sentence, breathing air is like you have that has to be done in order to survive. Right. Whereas the other ones are more like recommendations. Uh huh. Yeah. Good. Anybody else? Any any anybody who sees a difference between the first and the second sentence, or do you think it's the same must in the, the Emerald City sentence and the the baseball um, sentence? Any difference on that? I feel like the baseball sentence is a little bit conditional. So it's if the ball is put into play, then the batter must run the first place or first base. Uh huh. So kind of like the if and then kind of statements, right? So. It, it, the ball is put in play, then the batter must run to first base, right? So there's a little bit of a, a conditional uh, clause over there. Yeah, Trinity? Any, yeah. Else? any, any, any differences between uh, the first sentence and the second sentence? It also seems like the they're going from order of like, I guess, the first one, it's kind of like, oh, well, if you want to get to the Emerald City, you're going to want to follow the Yellow Brick Road. But then the second one, those are the rules of baseball. So if you're playing baseball, you have to stick to the rules. And then the third one, it's so it's like from least structured to most structured or least. Um, no, I don't want to say least important, but least assured, I guess. OK, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so in the last one is basically you have to do it. You just don't have a choice. But in in the first one, you know, you maybe there's another way of getting to Yellow Brick Road, right, or something like that. And in the baseball case, that is the rule of baseball. I mean, that's universally followed, right, wherever baseball is played, uh, kind of thing. So the difference. Uh, between the three kind of musts in English is in terms of, again, you know, to go back to that point that Olivia made and Trinity made and Kelly made about volition. In the first case, it is an obligation, right? So you have to follow that road if you want to reach Emerald City. So you have a goal. The goal is to reach Emerald City. It is your obligation to actually walk through the road to reach your goal, right? It's necessary for you to reach uh, if you wanna achieve your goal. In the second one, again, this is the rule of baseball, right? The batter has no choice but follow the rule, especially if he wants to continue playing baseball, right? I mean, he has a choice of not following the rules, but then he might not be drafted again to play baseball, right, in the next uh, season. Um, and in the last sentence, it is again, it's obligation, no choice, but it's somehow there is a, there is a much, you know, it's more immediate than the other two. So in some sense, if you hold your breath right now, you say, I don't want to breathe anymore. That's not going to end very well. Right. I mean, again, it's not a choice you have, whether you like it or not, you have to do it. Right. Um, the same thing with baseball. I mean, whether you like it or not, you have to do it. You have the choice of not doing it. But again, the consequences could be catastrophic. And for the yellow brick road, for example, there could be other ways of reaching Emerald City, but it's more like an obligation. Uh, like if you want to reach Emerald City, this is the easiest way to get there, right? Or this is the most immediate way of getting there um, kind of thing. So similarly, now in that the is in Valerian with Morgulis and Doheris, the meaning is very similar to the last meaning of must in English, where you actually don't have a choice, you are just obligated to do it. There is no question of volition, there is no question of choice, like you have with the Emerald City sentence and the, the sentence with the baseball um, must in it. So the implication of the is is the meaning 
that there's absolutely no choice. All men must die. That's, it's not a choice that they have. It's not in their volition, whether they want to die or not. Similarly, all men must serve. I mean, you know, um, say you're being drafted into the army or something. If you're a man, you have to serve. You just don't have a choice, right? The, the, the volition is not up to you. It is the, the, the rule of that particular land, right, uh, uh, in Valyrian. So the implication of the must, the is, is very similar uh, to that uh, kind of no volition, no obligation, no choice kind of meaning of must. So again, you can kind of complicate your language with choosing different tense and aspect markers. And depending on, you know, what kind of meaning you associate with these uh, tense and aspect markings, your language can get more complicated. So you can even have this kind of uh, different semantic content for the same uh, morphological marker, for example. So very often in some languages, you actually see the same morphological ending with different semantic content, right? Depending on the context, depending on the phonological uh, context in which it appears. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. So you can say that, you know, there is another marker is that does not mean must in this way, but it means must in the Emerald City way or something like that, right? So you're introducing ambiguity in your language, which is very similar to what exists in natural language and, you know, what exists in um, human language. Uh, so that's some way of, you know, that if you want to think about introducing tense and aspect markings in your constructed language, this is one way of doing that. So, um, David Peterson also had um, two different kinds of stem uh, formations in Valyrian verbs. So he actually had a perfect stem and an imperfect stem where perfect and imperfect are aspect markings, right? Not, not in the terms perfect and imperfect uh, stems like morphologically, but just with the aspect perfect and imperfect. Um, and what he did was he actually did this by adding uh, an extra morpheme to the verb. So he used the word tat to get the imperfect um, stem and tet to get the perfect uh, stem. So this is again one way in which he introduced complexity into the verbal morphology of Illyria. And he also added, uh, you know, some um, aspect similar to the aspectual markings that we saw in English with habitual and uh, perfective and progressive um, aspect. And here, the reading of the must uh, actually comes from the habitual interpretation of the aspect with the collective number that we talked about uh, when we talked about singular, plural, collective, and focal number marking. So you have the word rovis and rovisi, right? Uh, and the difference between rovis and rovisi is in aspectual marking. One is the habitual uh, marker. So the dogs are barking versus dogs bark. Can you tell me which one is the habitual aspect? Is it rovis or rovisi? Rovisi. Rovisi, right? Dogs bark. Habitually, they bark versus the dogs are barking is anchored right now, right? The dogs are barking in this particular moment in time. Uh, so that's a rovis. And then the, the I ending at the end of that verb is the, um, the habitual uh, marker or the habitual morphology, dogs bark. So here you have the final meaning of the is ending in Doheris and uh, Morgulis. It's basically the third person plural marking and in perfect aspect. Okay, so Doheris, the is, is third person, plural, perfect. Third person is the, uh, the person marking. Plural is a number marking and perfect is the aspectual marking. So just that is morpheme at the end of the verb is just packed in semantic content with three different kinds of meaning. But you see this very often, you see this in Latin, you see this in English, you see this in a lot of morphologically rich languages actually, that you can have a very tiny morpheme just packed in semantic content with meaning. Okay, so I highly recommend uh, thinking of this for your languages as well, uh, because you know you don't have to think about any complicated words. You can just have like 
a one morpheme, what one single wall as a morpheme, right? Like the E ending or the A uh ending, uh, and then just pack it with meaning so that you can take a root of a word and attach that morpheme to it and you can get, you know, another word in your uh, constructed language uh, packed in meaning. Um, so this is a, a strategy that I highly recommend um, you know, using. Um, there's also a reading associated with this, so you can read more about, uh, you know, how uh, Valyrian verbal morphemes are actually created um, and was created by David Peterson. So I highly recommend if you haven't done the reading uh, for this week to read that uh, chapter. Um, it's already up on Blackboard. All right, so we did Castilian, so I'm going to end this lecture here. Any questions on the Valyrian uh, verbal morpheme? All right, okay. So let's get into um, the last lecture um, before your midterm. This is the lecture on language variation. I have a question about the readings real quick before you have to leave. Uh -huh. and all um, so on the syllabus, some of the readings are found in the optional readings. So I just wasn't sure which ones are gonna be on the midterm. So I've just been following the syllabus, not so much whether it's optional or not. Uh, are you talking about how some of the readings are in the optional um, folder on Blackboard? Yeah, like the Oak Rent one was optional, but it was on the syllabus. Yeah, so if, if you see it on the syllabus, make sure you read it. That That's going to be, so the thing is my, the course has been migrated from an earlier point in time, but the syllabus is from this semester, right? So it's more up to date than the course that I migrated from an earlier version of Ling, Ling 151 that I taught like in a previous semester, right? So I might not have had a one-on-one -on -one correspondence between the reading, whether it's in the optional folder or in the required reading folder, but I, I will update that now that you mentioned that to me, but follow the syllabus. So if I've said that, Okrin 2009 is a required reading. It is a required reading. Okay, cool. That's, That's what I've been doing. So okay. just check. Thank yeah. you. I, I will, I, and I will double check now that you mentioned it to me, I will double check whether the, um, the readings are in the required folder or in the optional folder. But that could just be a typo from my end on Blackboard. Any other questions on the reading or? Um, so yes, so if I have, I have uploaded all your readings on Blackboard, like I said, um, you know, um, going into post uh, midterm as well, so that you can kind of get ahead of reading. But this is also your friendly reminder that your midterm is only two weeks away. You're going to take your midterm after your um, spring break. So the week after your spring break is when you're gonna take your midterm. Uh, we will talk next week more about your midterm because we will be doing um, a kind of midterm review next Thursday. So next Tuesday, we are gonna watch the movie. Um, right, so next Tuesday, we are going to be watching the movie, The Linguists. I'm gonna be streaming it on, uh, it's a documentary, so it's a, it's a an hour and a couple of minutes, so like an hour and 10 minutes. So we can definitely watch it within the, the hour that we have uh, for class. So I will be streaming it on, um, you know, here. Um, and you will be doing a summary of the documentary for your assignment for, so uh, do not miss next class, next Tuesday. Um, the, the documentary is also available in Abla Library. So if you cannot attend class next week, you can always check it out at the library and watch it um, if you have a DVD player. Um, and then, you know, do the summary um, of assignment four. But I will be handing out assignment four uh, on Tuesday when we watch, before we watch the movie so that, you know, you can kind of take notes um, as we go along. Um, so that's next Tuesday. And then next Thursday is when we do the midterm review. I will talk about the format of your midterm. I will talk about um, how to prepare for your midterm, what questions to expect. Um, you know, it's going to be a mix of multiple choice and uh, problem solving, kind of like the problems that we have done in the past in the 
lab sessions. And then, um, you know, depending on how much time we have following the midterm review, um, we will actually be solving more uh, problems in breakout rooms uh, on Thursday. So that's going to be next week. Um, so uh, today um, and Thursday is going to be your last lecture. So th this lecture is actually on language variation. That's going to be the last module that I cover before um, midterm. Sounds good? All right. So um, I'm kind of digressing away from the toolkits of language and um, case studies of constructed language to kind of give you an idea of uh, how languages vary and you know uh, this whole thing about dialects. So it's kind of like, it's good to know, it's good for you to keep in mind that even for your constructed language, there could be variations of constructed languages. So in the past, I've had students, some students create a high constructed language and low constructed language, similar to high Valyrian and low Valyrian, um, as we saw in last class, um, very similar to two different dialects of English, right? So let's talk about language variation. So here is an example of um, how English actually varies across um, different countries. So person A says, are you going to the party tomorrow? And B says, I might, and C says, I might do. Now, how many of you would actually respond to A with B? How many of you would actually say C? Anybody here who would respond with C? No, that's because you're not British English people, right? I mean, you all grew up in America, so you all speak American English. So the correct response in American English would be B, I might. But if you are, uh, you know, you grew up in London or um, somewhere in the United Kingdom and um, you spoke British English, you would actually respond with C, okay? This is a minor distinction between B and C. The only difference is in the auxiliary verb do, right, at the end of C. But it actually, you know, it, it syntactically, it's quite different, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, uh, but if you're interested, I will obviously, you know, I can explain to you what the syntactic difference is between B and C. But we often call this as an example of language variation between British English and American English. Now, here is a more local example. Um, a says, I haven't done anything, and B says, I ain't done nothing. Okay, how many of you would say A and how many of you would say B? Anybody here who would say B? I would say B, ironically. Okay. <laughs> Do you also say A or no? I usually say A, but when I'm kidding around with friends, I'll say B. Okay. And Landon said you would say B too? Yeah, sometimes. Okay. Depending on how formal the situation is, I slip into the, the ain'ts and the double negatives quite frequently. Okay, that's interesting. So the distinction is actually between standard English or what is known as standard English in the literature, um, which is A. And do, do, does anybody know what is AAVE? What the abbreviation AAVE stands for? Okay, so it's African American Vernacular English, AAVE. Um, and so B would be perfectly normal and perfectly common to say in African American vernacular English. So the idea is that if you are not a speaker of Abi, if you're not a speaker of African American vernacular English, you would say A and not B, right? Very often you see the double negatives in African American vernacular English and not in a more formal variety of English, which is often known as standard English. So, what is language variation? Why should we care about language variation? Um, why is there language variation? Why does language variation actually exist? Well, let's start with a why first. Why does language variation exist? Because we are all individual human beings. I mean, just like how we have different skin colors and different hair colors and different eye colors and different features, our languages differ, right? It's idiosyncratic to us right? Um, it's like how Landon and Trinity said, like sometimes you use the double negatives, even though you're probably not native speakers of African-American vernacular English, you still would use that in your variety of English. That's your idiosyncrasy, right? It, it, it's part of your grammatical structure and part of your lexicon of 
Landon's English and Trinity's English, right? So what is language variation? It's the different ways in which language can change in form. Now, language change is an entire class in and of itself, right? So I'm only going to dwell on this in today's lecture and on um, Thursday's lecture. So 15 minutes today, and then, uh, you know, I will complete the lecture on Thursday. But, you know, people are resistant to this idea because of the fact that if I ask you whether, you know, okay, let me actually ask you before, before I uh, say this. How many of you speak in an accent? How many of you have an accent? Okay, I, I see some of you like, you know, pretty um, certain and some of you may be uncertain and some of you who are quiet, I'm just gonna assume that you're saying no, you're shaking your head uh, because I can't see everybody. Um, but this, I think, is a very loaded question in the United States, just because it's very common for the term accent to have a very negative connotation, right? Um, so whenever you hear the term accent, you're always thinking that, oh, that person is not speaking formally, or that, speak, that person is not a native speaker, or that person is not uh, fluent in the standard ways of speaking English. But the reality is that everybody has an accent. I mean, your accent is American English accent, which is very different from British English or African American vernacular English or, you know, all the other world Englishes that we have, right? And I, I talk a lot more about world Englishes in history of English, um, because I think it's more relevant um, to history of English. But you know, the fact is that language changes just like human beings change. And, you know, we have changed across time and space the same way languages change because languages are actually living things just like how human beings are living things, right? So we breathe air into the languages we speak. Each language has a grammatical structure. It has a lexicon, it has syntax, it has, you know, all these rules for pronunciation but they keep changing across time. I mean, it's like how I told Kelly about this new sign for you know, LGBTQ in ASL. That's language change as we speak, right? Uh, an entire community of uh, you know, ASL speakers or uh, signers um, actually agreed on using that particular sign for LGBTQ, right? Which I think is amazing, right? It's, it's language change as we speak because we can see it in real time. So whenever we talk about language, I mean, the, the, the name of this course is the nature of language, right? I mean, it, it, the, the name of the course is not nature of dialects or languages and dialects. We talk about language a great deal, but we don't talk about dialect, but that's what I'm gonna be doing in this module on language um, variation. What is a dialect? How do we understand a dialect because again, when we talk about accent, when we talk about dialect, we are really talking about politically loaded terminology here. Um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to kind of differentiate between language and dialect and the politics and the socio-political structures behind um, you know, these kind of distinctions. Um, so here's a, a working definition of dialect. It is a variety of a language spoken by a group of people that is systematically different from other varieties of the language in terms of structure or lexical features. Now, I come from India. I grew up in India. Um, if you ask any Indian how many languages are spoken in India, you know, you would, we are the second largest, largest population in the world, you would probably get that many answers, right? There are no two people who agree on how many languages are spoken in India. You will hear the terms um, 19,500 19, to 1,600 to 120 to 25. Like th that's the range that we're talking about, right? Of confusion and ambiguity in the narrative. Now, if you ask me how many languages are spoken in India, my best guess is around 1,600, right? 1,500, 1,600, that's my best guess. Um, but we actually don't know. We actually don't know because the government actually doesn't want us to kind of have a 
real understanding of how many languages are spoken in India because of vote bank and you know gerrymandering and gaslighting and all those other you know kind of things that go along with the socio-political aspects of language. So very often you would see that um, they would say, oh, this is actually a dialect of the language, right? Very often you will hear your two people say this, oh, this is not a real language. This is actually a dialect of X language, right? But again, it's a very, you know, it's a very fluid situation. And the question that I, I want you to ask is, who decides what is a language and what is a dialect, right? And that's really what I want you to keep in mind. Now, I also introduced the term accent, right? Um, and, you know, I asked you the question, how many of you have an accent? But, you know, it's further muddled and muddied because of the negative connotation that I spoke about with accents. So you have dialects, and then on top of that, you have accents, right? And people don't want to say that they speak in accents and they speak in a dialect. Everybody wants to speak standard English or standard or whatever that language is, because you want to conform, right? And you want to be accepted. And very often, if you are speaking an accent or if you're not a non -native, if you're a um, non-native speaker of the language, you have a lot of baggage that comes along with that, which is why people try to steer away from that, right? So. The working definition of an accent is literally the way you speak, okay? So the difference between an accent and a dialect is a dialect is a lot more encompassing. So you have differences in lexicon and structures and grammar and phonology and morphology. But when you talk about accent, it's just the way you speak. It's the pronunciation. It's literally the dance of your tongue. Where is your tongue moving to in your mouth? right, where you're getting all these pronunciation differences, okay? So very often you talk about, you know, the British accent versus the American English accent, completely and starkingly different from each other, right? But also you can learn new accents and you can unlearn old accents. So, you know, um, during the, um, the um, early 2000s and 2000, you know, late 19 the 1990s and early 2000s. In India, there was a growing movement to learn the American English accent because a lot of call centers were actually outsourced to India. So you would be calling you know, for your phone if you have a problem or for your bank if you have a problem, you would actually be talking to an agent back in India, not in America because it's so much cheaper to do that. Um, and you know, they would be like, yeah, hi, I'm Mark, how can I help you today? But these are actually people who have been taught how to speak in American English. It was a huge movement. Can you imagine the, the demand that linguists you know, had at that point? It was like spiking through the roof, right? Everybody wanted to learn linguistics. Everybody wanted to be a accent trainer. It was a very cool, well-paying job to have at that point. Now, not so much anymore because you know, things are not as outsourced as uh, before. Um, but everybody wanted to learn American English because it was very cool to do that, right? It, it, it sounded so much cool to say I'm Mark than, you know, say my Indian name, right, um, et cetera. So that's the difference between accent and um, dialect. Uh, certain accents have more prestige associated with it, you know, going back again to the fact that some countries are first world versus some countries are not, right, et cetera, et cetera. So all the sociopolitical. Um, aspects. So you can kind of, you know, um, you have the prestige aspect with accents and dialects. Some dialects and some accents are more prestigious than other uh, varieties. Again, going back to socio-political reasons, not because the language itself is more superior, right, or the accent itself is more superior, but you know, you can often talk about the Southern accent, right, in America. So people from the South actually speak very differently from the Midwest, right? Um, if you talk to other people in the Midwest, if you have not taken a linguistics class, you will often hear Midwesterners talk about themselves as being very neutral, right? They say, we don't have an accent, we are very neutral, right? We speak very standard dialects of English. And then, you know, it's very easy for Midwesterners to be like, oh, 
the West Coast, very different. East Coast, again, very different. Southern accent, oh my God, completely different. Right. Um, and then obviously you have Wisconsin and Chicago, Chicago, right? And all that kind of accents. Again, very different from the Midwestern accent. So I have found across the board that Midwestern people are the ones who believe that they have absolutely no accent, right? Um, and I've taught in the West Coast and I've taught back in India. And you know, I've yeah, I've, I've seen Midwestern to be like the more people who think that they have the more neutral uh, kind of accents. All right, so let's actually look at this dude who can switch between different dialects and switch between different accents. Um, let's see if I can open that video real quick. By advertising on YouTube, I catch the eye of my ideal customers at the right time. Hey, boys and girls. So today I'm going to do a video that's probably the most requested video that I get, and that is a video purely dedicated to accents. Be forewarned, some of them probably aren't perfect, but I tried my best. So let's carry on. This is what I normally sound like. I may have a New Jersey accent on some words, but I think for the most part, this is pretty much middle American. This is mostly a New York City accent with the exception of Manhattan. And some people think that most people from New Jersey talk like this too, but that simply ain't true. Because if your home is in South Jersey, then you probably sound like this. I'll have wheat toast with better. No one hardly gets the Boston accent right. Pardon me, but we're not from New York people. You know, it really grinds my gears when I hear people trying to do a Southern accent. Y'all think we all sound like this guy. What you mean this guy? what this guy ever do to you? Be right back, I gotta fix my tractor. Yeah! This is one of my favorites. Apparently, when polled, a good portion of people voted the Midwestern accent to sound the most pleasant. I don't wanna toot my own horn here, but I agree. I'm not sure about this guy, but I'm Navajo, and I think we have the best accent. Whoa, did you just see that guy fall off his board? <sighs> yeah, man, I totally swiped out and that girl got it on film. Oh my god, I can't believe I got that hella hot guy losing his shorts on camera. Hello and welcome to the United States of the 1940s. You know when gas used to be 20 cents a gallon. What? How much is it in the future? Yeah, see, I'm gonna whack this guy, see. What, does that mean something different in the future? Bagels, eh? Sorry, this project I'm working on is preventing me from going on the boat. Orale, vato, come here. What you waiting for, Mac? Come on, I've been waiting forever. You don't think me can do a Jamaican accent, but for you, me one try. Not sure if I can do Irish either, but it was a popular request, so I'll try it out. Right, so most people that do an English accent tend to exaggerate it, and it ends up sounding like, Hey, 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 I am fully aware that no one speaks like this in England. And yes, contrary to popular belief, I, along with many other educated Americans, can point to England on a map. Right then, yeah, this accent always reminds me of Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins. I've not met one American person that can do an Aussie accent. Most likely this one included. Is it time to go yet? No, really, I am starved. I have not eaten since this morning. I know, right? This guy's taking forever. Hello, my English is not very good. Let me get my friend for you. Ciao, ciao, what can I help you find? You're not looking for nothing? Hey, what are you calling me all here for? He's always so hot-headed. I tell him to relax, but he doesn't listen to me. Hey, enough fighting, huh? Don't fight. I not go, my guess. I uh, don't know how I sound to speak English. This is a Chinese accent sound like a Peter Chow. This is a Kanto accent. Hi, I would like to say this is my Japanese accent. Thank you. Don't buy that shampoo. It's for a thin hair. You have a very sick hair. Honey, how your mom? Tell I say hi. How she do? Okay, okay, I'll talk to you later. After this video, let's get something to eat. Chicken figure fat cut from Chris Rux, how about that? But no, how about you just come to my house and my wife will cook you some also chop? Hey, what about me? Both of you always forget about me. How about we get that girl dancing, see? No. <laughs> What did you think? That was amazing. I love that video. It's in my favorites. 
and actually um he his channel um i watch a lot of his stuff um right now he's um learning spanish and like documenting his learning spanish journey okay cool yeah it, it, i mean it is not easy to switch like that between accents i mean let me tell you right um and that's what what 34 35 different different accents i mean that's not easy and especially like with that mandarin chinese that he went into a little bit and you know italian and all that so you know i i think that was really really cool um and you know i didn't know that he was learning spanish i don't follow his journey on youtube uh london so you know <laughs> that that would be pretty cool uh if you're interested or you're learning spanish yourself right so uh, okay, so that I think is a good place to stop. I am going to hop into my uh, department presentation now and Landon is going to take over. So um, stay on the video call. I'm going to stop recording. I think I do. Can I just leave this meeting and then I don't I don't know. But if I end the meeting, do you think you'll all exit and then you'll have to log back in? Is that how it is? You. I'm believe that no. that might be the case <laughs> because the only i don't see a leave meeting i only see an end meeting yeah. option i think you might have to make me a presenter or something okay. like that okay so let me see let me see if i can make you a host okay um, okay i'm gonna make you the host change host host all right okay now i can leave i think okay all right, um, I'm going to stop recording if that's okay, just to make sure that we get that portion of the lecture. Um, and then you can record another one, Landon, if you want, because you're the host right now. So does that sound good? Okay.